Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start with a, um, a travel announcement. <clears throat> Secretary Blinken will travel to Paris, France, uh, and Brussels and Leuven, German, uh, Belgium, April 1st to 5th, to underscore our commitment to the NATO alliance, strengthening transatlantic partnerships, and addressing global challenges. In Paris, Secretary Blinken will meet with French President Macron to discuss support for Ukraine, efforts to prevent escalation of the conflict in Gaza, and a number of other important issues. The Secretary will then travel to Brussels, where he will participate in the NATO Foreign Minister's meeting, which coincides with the 75th anniversary of NATO on April 4th, and have meetings with NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba, and representatives from other allied nations. While in Brussels, Secretary Blinken and USAID Administrator Power will jo also join a US-EU trilateral meeting with Armenia, together with European Commission President von der Leyen and Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan regarding U.S. and EU support for Armenia's economic resilience as it works to diversify its trade partnerships and address humanitarian needs. In Leuven, Belgium, Secretary Blinken will participate in the six U.S.-EU Trade and Technology Council meetings, emphasizing our shared dedication to innovation and economic collaboration. As part of this visit, Secretary Blinken will explore the innovative initiatives at IMEC, a Belgian semiconductor research center. And with that, Sean, um, let's start us. Sure, can I just, maybe just with a quick question on this. Uh, the Armenia meeting, it's probably not the first question you're expecting, yeah. but, but it's purely Armenian, not Azerbaijan. Or Correct, kind of purely Armenian meeting. Okay, and uh, do you expect the, uh, the, the issues with Azerbaijan to, to come up? Uh, you know, I suppose it's always possible it could come up on the margins of the meeting uh, in that type of conversation, but that's not the focus of the meeting. The meeting in Brussels is to focus on Armenia's economic resilience as it works to diversify its trade partnerships and address humanitarian needs. Okay. Um, switching to Gaza, um, dissent in the State Department. Uh, one, of course, you've seen the um, uh, the, the statement by uh, by a State Department uh, employee, if, you, if that's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the terminology. Uh, who quit uh, over the uh, the policy in Gaza? Do you have any reaction to the resignation uh, broadly and and more generally about uh, about how um, how State Department employees can express dissent? Yeah, a, a few things. So one, just a, a factual note on on the point about employees. So she was a fellow at the State Department. Uh, my understanding had just finished the first year of a fellowship that could have gone for two years, um, and did not exercise her option to return for a second year uh, as a fellow. With respect to um, dissent at the State Department, so. There is a broad diversity of views inside the State Department about uh, our policy with respect to Gaza, just as there is a broad diversity within the State Department about our, uh, our policy in a number of important foreign policy uh, uh, issues, as there is a broad diversity of views and opinions throughout American society about this issue and others. What we try to do uh, in the State Department, what the Secretary has instructed his team to do, is to make sure that people have an opportunity to make their views known. Uh, he wants to hear them. Uh, he reads uh, dissent cables when dissent cables are authored uh, on any issue. Uh, he meets uh, with employees who have a broad range of views. He listens to their feedback and he takes it into account in his decision making and he encourages other senior leaders in the department to do so as well. And that's what he'll, he will continue to do and what we will all try to continue to do because we believe that um, uh, actually listening to dissent informs uh, better decisions. Uh, having our having decisions challenged helps us make better ones in the future. So it's something that we will continue to encourage and support. I mean, it, to expand on that, I mean, is it is it uh, is it helpful? Is it does it uh, what does it say about U.S. policy to have uh, an employee or a contractor resign? Is that something that? Uh, you think is, is fine if somebody disagrees with the policy? Uh, how do you? I think everyone can make decisions for the, for themselves about what they're going to do. One of the things I would note, uh, even in the the first story that I read about this, the the um, uh, the the individual in question herself noted that she attends meetings where there are people who have the exact opposite view of hers and express them openly. And that's what we encourage people to do. And ultimately, they have to make decisions about their future employment status. Can I follow up on that? Can let me, oh yeah, Michelle. Um, one of the things she talks about is uh, the the, um, the ongoing military aid to um, Israel, and I know you've heard concerns on the Hill about that and about uh, you know some pushback uh, on that. But I wonder if you're hearing more pushback within the building on the issue <clears throat> of continued military sales to Israel. So I wouldn't say that I have noted a. Um, change in the, I mean, first of all, I should say it's always hard to speak broadly for uh, an employee base that in, 
encapsulates thousands of people. Um, I don't think there's any one individual short of doing some kind of uh, quantitative survey that could, that could measure that. <clears throat> but I wouldn't say that I've seen a, a, a marked change in employee opinion over time. But it is true that there have been a diversity of views for some time over our policy with respect to Israel. I don't think that's been any secret. You've seen people uh, uh, talk about it publicly. Some of the meetings that we've held uh, have been extensively reported on by the individuals in those meetings. So all I can say is what, what, how we view that employee sentiment, and that's what I just said a minute ago, which is the secretary welcomes it. And what he doesn't want to, uh, to happen is for people to have views and not make them known. Whether they agree with the policy that the president has decided and the secretary has decided and that we are pursuing, or whether they disagree with them, maybe even especially when they disagree with them, that's when he wants them to speak up and challenge his thinking and let him know what they think. And it doesn't mean that we are going to change our policy just based on what every employee thinks. That's not the way this organization works. It's not the way any organization works. There's a president that was elected by the American uh, public. There is a secretary who was appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate who have the responsibility to make policy decisions based on what they believe, <clears throat> excuse me, is in the national security interests of the United States. And they will continue to do that. And they are the only ones that can do that. But they do want to take into account the feedback that they get from employees, whether that is uh, feedback where they agree or disagree with the decisions that they make. Humaira, so. um, Matt, just switching a little bit on uh, something else mm -hmm. on Gaza. Um, NBC is reporting that um, Netanyahu's office has uh, sought to reschedule the meeting that was supposed to happen this week in Washington, um, and that it might happen as early as next week. Do you have anything on that at all? I can't, con I can't confirm that exact report, but I can say that we do think it's important that that meeting happen. Uh, as we've said, we think that the uh, plan that Israel has said it intends to pursue with respect to Rafah is one that would be a mistake, uh, that would have enormous, uh, a, a terrible impact on the civilian population there and would weaken Israel's security. And we think there's a better way. And uh, we want to have the opportunity to present that better alternative to Israel. So we do think it's important that that meeting take place, but I don't have any scheduling updates. Do you have, have you had any interactions since it, since that meeting was canceled with your Israeli counterparts that suggests that they are indeed willing to have that meeting and that it could happen anytime soon? So we have had a number, we have had uh, interactions with our Israeli yeah. counterparts since and we have them every day. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, when and, and if and where and how a meeting might be scheduled. Okay. On the, on the hostage talks, um, what can you tell what can you tell us on the latest? It looks like they're in a bit of an impasse, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Are they at an impasse? Did they break down or are you still hopeful? And um, what, if at all, like, are there any US teams on the ground indirectly talking to, uh, you know, continuing the, the negotiations? So first of all, I would not share that characterization of the talks. Uh, I'm not gonna speak to the, the presence of US negotiating teams. We've uh, often not done that um, uh, uh, because we wanted those, those conversations to happen privately. Uh, we do think that over the, you know, let's say the past week up into this weekend, that real progress was made to achieving a deal, but you heard the secretary speak to this, I think it was a Friday in Israel. Just by nature of these types of negotiations, when you get down to the end, when you make progress, the issues that remain are often the hardest ones. You don't usually solve the hardest issues first, or first you solve them last. And so some of the remaining issues that need to be resolved are some of the most difficult ones and uh, areas where there is the most disagreement between Israel and Hamas. We do think it's possible to bridge those differences, and we're going to continue to try to bridge those differences because we think a ceasefire that secures the release of hostages would be uh, in the interests of uh, the United States, in the interests of Israel, and in, in the interests of the broader region. So you can confirm that the conversation on this is still ongoing? I'm not, concern I'm not confirming any particular conversation, but the hostage talks, um, uh, the, the hostage negotiations, we do not believe are over. We do not believe they've come to an end. Uh, we believe that there is uh, an ability to, con to continue to pursue um, the release of hostages, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Can I just follow up briefly yeah. on one of the, the answers you gave to Hamera? Uh, when, when she asked about uh, Rafa and you <clears> said um, that it would have, that the operation would have an enormous uh, and terrible impact on the civilian population, 
we can Israel security. Uh, just the, the defense minister, Gallant, with, when he was at the Pentagon, um, the readout that the Pentagon gave said that, uh, said that Austin, Secretary Austin told him that operations in Rafah should not proceed without a credible and implementable plan. I presume you'll say there's no daylight there, but, but is, is it the U.S. position that, uh, Rafa, that the Rafah operation should not go ahead at all or that Israel can give assurances and can... Our position has been that it should not go forward uh, in the way that they have contemplated, the way that you've heard us describe it um, uh, for the past, I think it's 10 days now, that a full-scale military operation um, into Rafah would be a mistake and it's not something that we can support. What we have said is the kind of mission that we could support is a, um, a much more targeted, limited campaign that could still achieve the same objectives, that could still um, uh, <clears throat> lead to the defeat of those remaining Hamas battalions inside Rafah, but without massive harm to the civilian population, without hindering the deliver, uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance, and without actually weakening Israel's security instead of strengthening it. To follow up on that, and this might be more of a DOD question, but you do believe that a more limited campaign could take out those four battalions? We do. We do. And it has Israel given any indication that they share that they share the thinking that this is a possibility? So I'm not going to, I think you mean with respect to the, the, the plan limited, that we, yeah. so we haven't actually presented them that plan in any kind of detailed way. That's the meeting that was supposed to be happening today, tomorrow, that was canceled. So it's hard to have, hard to, um, uh, I think hard for them to react to something which they have not yet fully seen. Um, and then Maybe, separately, uh, last week on Friday when the Secretary was in Israel, it was announced that Ben Gavir's coalition would be annexing additional uh, land in the Jordan Valley, in the uh, Palestine. Uh, Palestinian territory. Do you have any response to this? So we have been very clear about uh, this matter. Um, we've been unequivocal. Uh, number one, the Israeli government settlement program is inconsistent with international law. And number two, settlement expansion only serves to hinder the prospect of real peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians. Um, this is, you know, there's something similar to the point I was making with respect to a full-scale Rafah campaign. The expansion of settlements doesn't just harm the Palestinian people. We think that ultimately it makes Israel less safe. It makes Israel weaker, not stronger. It hinders the kind of integra further integration into the region that is ultimately the best path for long-term security to Israel. So we have made that quite clear to them. We've been very direct and candid about it in our conversations with them. And of course, we've said the same thing publicly and we'll continue to do that uh, at the highest levels of our government. Go ahead. Go. Just one, yeah, one, and then we'll... one thing on the dissent, um, and we've talked about it quite a bit over the mm. last months, but um, you say that the secretary takes it very seriously and listens to it and all that, but we have seen no change in U.S. policy in a way uh, that shows us that that dissent or that feedback uh, or that disagreement is taken into account. Um, so I'm just wondering, what is the point of so, the the whole channel? And like, I mean, the secretary listens, and we we've all reported about various listening sessions uh, between mid-level or like more senior officials with the secretary, more junior officials. If it's not, if if it's it's being heard, but if it's not taken into account in the policy at all. So then don't you think it's so, a little bit pointless? So I would disagree with that completely. It is taken into account in the policymaking process. Um, the secretary has heard things in those meetings that he takes on board and that he that influences his thinking and that he brings to bear in making policy decisions. Now, if what you mean is are we going to execute a complete reversal of the policy no, that we, implement, I mean. we implemented or I mean. um, are you going to are we going to implement exactly some of the policies that the people in these meetings have no, called not at for? All. Um, that's not that, how. That's, hold on. That means, that's not how this process works. That's not how government no, works. No, I don't and think that's, that's, that's anyone's expectation. Say, that's not how any organization works. I dare say any of the media organizations in this room, if reporters go to their bosses um, and offer feedback, and the bosses say, "Well, that's a good point. We're going to take that to bear." But on the larger policy, this is the decision that we have made. That's how. That's You're how doing a long rant on something works. that I didn't suggest. But do you have any examples on, you know, any any? Any yeah. changes? I like, will, I will say, I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, I will say with respect to any number of issues, with respect to the delivery of humanitarian assistance, we have heard good ideas from people inside the building who have come and offered constructive feedback, and we have implemented those. So, now, now, there are people that when you say, if, like, if the idea is that 
to the, the United States to cut off support for Israel, that's just a fundamental policy uh, disagreement. So when you see uh, people who uh, offer interviews that say, we want the United States to stop supporting Israel's right to defend itself, that's not something the secretary agrees with. It's not something the president agrees with. And ultimately, um, they are the ones who have the responsibility of making those decisions. And so we want to listen to the feedback. But ultimately, it's only the president and the secretary who can make those decisions that they were elected and appointed and confirmed by the Senate to do on behalf of the American people. So we want to hear the feedback. We'll take in. Uh, uh, take and on in humanitarian aid, you're yeah. saying you've actually heard out some of your more junior staffers and Ab like the dissent from the administration and that actually Ab helped Ab you Ab pressure Israel more it is that perhaps it, you wouldn't have otherwise? It, it's not a question of, of, of pressuring Israel more. It's the question of taking good ideas from people um, and incorporating them into the policies that we're implementing. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, I, on uh, Jennifer's point, on the land expropriation that Israel just did and the Jordan Valley now that they expropriated or took or stole whatever you want to call it 8,000 dunams which is roughly uh, 2,000 acres now this may be somebody's backyard in Texas but the West Bank is a big chunk it's a huge piece of land and also you know not the same amount but the similar amount in Bethlehem now I know you express time and again you know your displeasure with these actions, but really the Israelis never take your displeasure into account. Would you agree with that assessment that they have not once <coughs> retreated and said, okay, the Americans are upset, so I'm going to cancel these plans? So I will say that we have a fundamental disagreement uh, with the Israeli government over this issue, and right. we have made that quite clear. Yeah, but okay, you make it very clear, but beyond making it clear to them, because I'm sure they understand your position, they have understood it for decades. What are you willing to do to, to so, put some, some leverage, I mean, you know, a, a word that has been so, really overused, some leverage into your sentiments? So you make a good point in your question, Saeed, which is that this has been an issue on which the United States and the government of Israel have disagreed for decades. Right. And it is an issue that a number of administrations of both parties uh, have pressed the government of Israel to take action on. And uh, we will continue to do that, and we will continue to be clear about what we think about these actions. And ultimately, it's why we will continue to pursue an effort to establish an independent Palestinian state and resolve these longstanding questions so you don't have this um, uh, decades of encroachment in the West Bank that are, bede that are bedeviling um, the Israeli government, bedeviling the, the uh, Palestinian people, and ultimately making peace more difficult. Mm -hmm. A couple of more issues, if I may, you know, uh, uh, just to follow up. You said in the beginning that, uh, you know, at the top, you said that the Secretary is going to Paris to discuss with his French counterparts and so on, means to, to keep the level, not, not to have the war expand beyond what it is. But really, for the people of Gaza, I don't know how much worse this war can go on. I mean, how, how it can get. I mean, it is uh, life, I mean, being able to go back to what they had, it, it seems so, you know, uh, light years away and so on. So what do you say to them? I mean, I mean you know, I, this I, is, I mean, I understand you don't want this war to go into Lebanon, other places so and so on. So I, for I, the people, I, I would say to them what you have heard me say and what you have heard the secretary say, which is that yeah. is exactly why we are working so hard right. to get an immediate sustained mm -hmm. ceasefire that will secure the release of hostages and why we want it to ultimately expand on that and try to bring an enduring into the conflict site so mm -hmm. that is why what we have been exactly what we have been working on trying to accomplish mm -hmm. um, and it's why you have seen u.s negotiators travel to the region on multiple occasions it's why you've seen the secretary engage with counterparts in uh, Qatar mm -hmm. and egypt and mm -hmm. israel about this very question because we don't want to see this war go on a day longer than necessary. We don't want to see any more Palestinian civilians die. We didn't want to see any Palestinian civilians die in the first place. And so we do want to bring, uh, uh, we do want to achieve an immediate ceasefire that gets the hostages out and alleviates their suffering, which you didn't mention in your question. And we want to see ultimately an enduring into this conflict. Okay. So let me ask you, have you, um, did you see or read the report uh, made by Francesca uh, Albanese uh, yesterday in Geneva, where she cited, where she actually, what she showed was irrefutable, as far as she's concerned, irrefutable evidence that Israel engaged in genocide. Did you, did you see the report? What is your comment? On I, I did see the report. Let me say a couple things about it. First, um, <clears throat> we have 
long for long standing uh, for a long standing period of time oppose the mandate of this special rapporteur, uh, which we believe uh, is not productive. And when it comes to the individual who holds that position, I can't help but note um, a history of anti-Semitic comments that she has made that have been reported. She made, she made anti-Semitic comments? She has, yeah. and comments she made um, in December that appeared to justify the attacks of October 7th. So I think it's uh, important to take that into account. But with respect to the um, uh, report itself, we have made clear that we believe that allegations of genocide are unfounded, but at the same time, we have, are deeply concerned by the uh, number of civilian casualties in Gaza, and that's why we have uh, pressed the, the government of Israel on uh, multiple occasions to do everything it can to minimize those civilian casualties. Yeah, well, she's been getting a lot of uh, death threats and other threats and so on, you know, because people think she made uh, anti-Semitic comments and so on. Let me just go oh, sorry, to another hold on. You, you, hold, can't no, make a comment no. like that without letting me respond. Obviously, death threats against anyone are inappropriate. Okay. All right, let me uh, ask you also about the you know, you're talking with the Israelis about a different way of going after uh, the operatives or leaders uh, of Hamas and, and Rafah rather than a full-scale invasion. I mean, two things on this. Uh, one is, of course, uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, said that, you know, by April, come what may, they're going to go in uh, to Rafah. But that uh, aside, how do you envision this? I mean, th we're talking about a city that is the population before uh, October 7 was 250,000. Now it's 1.4 million people it is you know and and allegedly all the operatives operate out of tunnels and so on so you envision let's say uh, forces like the delta force or similar forces the israeli forces and so on going in you know while these people are so crowded being there how how would they so, do it so how would this really so happen I, I, when I, you have such hold uh, on uh, I, I got the question I, okay. I, I appreciate your um uh, request to be invited into the meeting where we would brief on these exact options to the government of israel well, but uh, uh i think i'm going to decline to make those public uh before and uh certainly before we can talk to the government of israel about them Thank you. Alex, go ahead. Thanks, uh, a couple of questions about the trip, uh, going back to Armenia, uh, trilateral meeting. Um, you probably have seen the Azeri reaction this morning in response to yesterday's comments. They called it dividing, quote unquote. They said the U.S. and the EU might uh, share responsibility for potential escalation following this meeting. What's your reaction I have to follow? Uh, uh, so um, I, I obviously would not agree with those comments. The focus of this meeting is on economic resilience to help Armenia diversify its trade partnerships and address humanitarian needs. I fail to see why that would be um, escalatory or would be of concern to any country in the world. Can you walk us through what went into the decision to establish this trilateral format? How much of Armenia's decision to stay away from Russia and to pursue the EU pathway uh, you know, trigger this meeting? Uh, I, I don't have any further comment other than what I just said. And on the Paris, uh, Paris uh, leg of the trip, you might have seen the Bloomberg's report this morning that the U.S. has been angry at uh, President Macron over his statements, you know, uh, to send uh, Western troops to Ukraine. Do you have any reaction? Will that be discussed between the Secretary and uh, the President Macron? I don't have any reaction to that report, and I'd, I'm not going to preview the, the meeting in detail, but of course we have made clear that the United States is not going to send any uh, troops to Ukraine. And finally, on, on Russia, I know I'm eating a dead horse. And I here. should add that, of course, that President Macron is a long time, uh, uh, the head of a long time ally of the United States. We work productively with him uh, on a number of matters, including support for Ukraine. So, on, on that point, is it about the U.S. objecting, uh, sending American soldiers to, you, to, to Ukraine, or are you objecting I don't even know what we're, I, I, so altogether? I haven't read the report you're talking about. I don't know who the, I'm guessing, anonymous officials quoted it, so I don't have, I, I'm certainly not going to comment on it. Fair enough. And finally, on Russia, uh, I know I'm beating the dead horse here, but do you have any reaction to uh, Zaharova's latest uh, comments today? She, you know, doubled it down. She said the U.S. actually created the, uh, you know, uh, the, the West has created the ISIS. Your uh, initial re rejection of Ukrainian involvement to Moscow concert was too soon, was suspicious, and she said that she has extremely hard time understanding why, how ISIS could conduct that that sort of. Uh, uh, so I've I've seen those comments as well as comments from President Putin as well as um, comments from others claiming that any host of countries uh, were behind this terrorist attack and and I think it's clear that these claims are categorically false. I think the Russian government knows that the claims are categorically false. Ukraine wasn't behind these attacks. The UK wasn't behind these attacks. The United States wasn't behind these attacks. In fact, the United States warned Russia about the possibility of these attacks in advance because 
We wanted to uh, see that the, if the attacks could be averted and ultimately uh, prevent a loss of life from the Russian people or by the, Ru the Russian people. So uh, I would say that these comments from multiple Kremlin officials uh, are irresponsible, they're cynical, and it's just another example of President Putin and the rest of his team exploding, exploiting a national tragedy to try to justify the illegal war against Ukraine. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. I will go back to the UN Security Council resolution, which was adopted uh, Monday. Yesterday, you said it should be implemented, but at the same time, you're also saying it's non-binding. So I don't understand. Can you explain how this resolution will be implemented? Implemented so, while you are called so it we believe. It, oh, sorry. I, no, sorry. Can you say the last part because I interrupted you and then walked on, walked okay, all over so your how words. How this can be implemented is. while you are calling it non-binding? Uh, we believe it can be implemented through a ceasefire agreement that secures the release of the hostages, which is what we are trying to pursue through negotiations. If you look at the resolution, it called for a number of things: a ceasefire and the release of hostages. And we think those both of those goals are important, and that's what we're trying to implement through the negotiations that have been uh, ongoing um, with the government of Israel, with the government of uh, Egypt, and the government of Qatar. But, I mean, I used to call it non-binding. Uh, I spoke to this yesterday. We're, we believe it's non-binding, that it doesn't impose any new legal obligations on any of the parties, but we do believe it should be implemented, and we are working to try and see that it is implemented through a ceasefire agreement that secures the release of hostages. Just one more on that. Uh, Secretary Blinken and President Biden has been emphasizing the importance of uh, the rules-based international order as the core of American foreign policy. And, uh, you know, the core of the rules-based order is the UN Security Council resolutions, which essentially represents the international law. So do you think calling a UN Security Council resolution non-binding contradicts with your commitment to rules-based uh, order? No, and I, th I think um, uh, if you look at exactly what we have meant by those comments, we're just offering uh, an exact legal uh, definition of what the the resolution does and does not impose, but it does not change our belief in the importance of the UN Security Council resolution and our, or the UN Security Council and our belief that UN Security Council resolutions should be implemented, including this one, including this one and the previous ones, like all the UN Security Council resolutions. The, uh, with respect, to, yes, of course, all of them. Do you think there's a follow-up? Uh, if you're referring to ones that vetoed, that we vetoed, obviously we don't believe those, those are not the those not those did not pass uh, the UN Security Council. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on on the, the issue of non-binding, um, is is it the the view of the administration that that UN Security Council resolutions in general are, are non-binding? I mean, all every time North Korea does something, there's always a statement that North Korea is out of compliance with. There, with the UN Security Council resolution, should the North Koreans read what's happening here and say, well, this is just a... Uh, no, uh, there are different types of UN Security Council resolutions. There are some UN Security Council resolutions that impose direct binding obligations in the parties. And if you look at the sanctions resolutions, that have, um, uh, which are the ones that I think you're, you're uh, speaking to with respect to North Korea, those impose direct obligations on the parties. Uh, and then there are different kinds of resolutions, like the one yesterday, which do not impose direct obligations, but we very much believe should be implemented. Michelle, like so, go ahead. Yeah, uh, on uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah, uh, the tensions, uh, the tension and the fightings are escalating between both of them. Uh, are you still hopeful that there will be a uh, diplomatic solution for the situation there? We do still want to see a diplomatic uh, solution. It's something that we have um, uh, pursued. We believe that preventing escalation uh, is of utmost importance, and we will continue to work towards a diplomatic, diplomatic resolution that would allow Israeli and Lebanese citizens to return to their homes and live in peace and security. Thanks. I'll go, I want to go back to Gaza, Matt. Uh, there's been a lot of questioning and talking about getting food and water into Gaza, but there is also a shortage of medicine, a shortage of hospitals. Uh, according to WHO, uh, only two of the 36 hospitals in Gaza operate at limited capacity and other 10 partially operating. What, one day they operate, three days they don't. Something like, do you have any updates on the efforts to 
to address this issue. So uh, if you look at my, I'm not trying to, to quibble with the, the first part of the question, but if you look at uh, the way I've talked about it from this podium, I often talk about the need of getting food and water and medicine in, and the Secretary has, has talked about that too. And it's not, it's also been a focus of our diplomatic efforts, and it's been a focus uh, of the work our team has done on the ground, is try to get not just food and water, but medicine in. And it's something we've coordinated with uh, a number of countries are. Uh, I would say in addition to those hospitals there, are, of course, the UAE is operating a field hospital in Gaza um, to provide uh, medical assistance to those uh, who need it. Uh, it continues to be a focus of our, our diplomatic efforts. We want to see medical supplies get in. We want to see uh, hospitals uh, uh, open and operating and able to treat patients who we know very much need it. We know the conditions under which doctors are working uh, right now are extreme uh, and incredibly difficult, and they're making extraordinary sacrifices to deliver life-saving treatment to people who really need it and in many cases don't have anywhere else to go. So we will continue to support that work and do everything we can to see that uh, it be expanded. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, Niger. Um, the, uh, the Nigerian government uh, just today said that they met with the U.S. Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Fitzgibbon, and that she laid out um, a, a timeline, some logistical timeline, um, logistical information on how U.S. troops would be withdrawn. And this, is, of course, comes a day after um, the junta leader spoke with Putin. Uh, do you have any update on, uh, on Niger and whether this... I, I don't. Only that you saw us say over the past 10 days or so, almost two weeks now, that uh, we would be in touch with the transition authorities to seek clarification uh, and discuss next steps. And we have been having those conversations. Uh, but I don't think it would be productive for me to read them out publicly. I mean, is that false, what they're saying? That the uh, again, country... I just don't, I don't want to, to get into what, from our perspective at least, are private diplomatic conversations. Okay. So the troops are, for, for the moment, the, the troop situation is the same with the U.S. It, it, it is the same. And, of course, with any, I, I say broadly the same with respect to any specifics, I would refer that to the, sure. the Pentagon. Just, just a couple of other issues. Uh, do you have anything to say about Togo, uh, the, uh, the new constitution and the crackdown on opposition? I think I'll have to take that one back. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, but I'll try. I'll try a different one. Though. Um, completely different part of the world. Uh, Burma slash Myanmar. Um, the another junta. Uh, the the junta chief there was saying, I believe it was today, that it's going to be difficult to hold elections because of insurgencies around the country. Does the U.S. have anything to say about that? Let me take that. I haven't seen that specific comment, so let me take it back and get you a a, a comment. My question is about uh, China, uh, the Chinese regime. So this, the, there's been a string of uh, recent bomb threats that the FBI is investigating and a mass shooting threat against uh, New York-based Shen Yun Performing Arts. Uh, these threats are being made in Chinese. And uh, given the Chinese Communist Party's track record of transnational repression against Falun Gong and on U.S. soil, uh, how concerned is the State Department of these recent developments? So we uh, condemn transnational repression in any form uh, committed by any country, but with respect to these specific uh, developments, I would refer you to law enforcement to speak to them. Thanks, Matthew. <clears throat> um, this is on uh, the Baltimore Bridge. <clears throat> the crew of the ship that crashed into the Baltimore Bridge is from India. Has the U.S. been in touch with India over the tragedy and the crew members? Uh, I... Um, I do not have any update on that. I'll have to get, I can say that the Office of Foreign Missions is generally continuing to monitor the situation and will reach out directly to any foreign missions should we receive uh, information about their citizens being affected. But with respect to any one country, uh, I don't have an update. And there were at least uh, three foreigners who were members of the crew doing maintenance on the bridge when it collapsed. One was from Honduras, and according to uh, Mexico's president, uh, two from Mexico. Can you confirm that one of the workers was or is from Honduras, as reported by the New York Times? Has state been in touch with the countries of those workers, including Honduras and Mexico? And does state have any information on the nationalities of the crew members? So we are aware of the reports that some of the individuals on the bridge uh, were from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. I, I would just say, first of all, that our deepest condolences go out to the families uh, of those who may have lost a loved one. And with respect to those um, who have injured. We wish for uh, a quick recovery. Uh, and as I said, the Office of Foreign Mi Missions is continuing to monitor the situation. We'll reach out directly to any foreign missions should we receive uh, information about their citizens, but I don't have specific updates to offer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, two questions, basically. So United States has reservations, very clear reservations on Chinese investments in Pakistan. And in a, another terrorist attack, five Chinese engineers killed it is just another follow-up of series of incidents. 
so there are many questions on united states and pakistan that there is lack of uh, intelligence sharing between pakistan and united states and the united states is not addressing enough pakistan security challenges to combat it counter terrorism efforts so uh, will united states join any investigations for that matter that uh, in which chinese citizens killed number one uh, i'm not aware of any request for us to do so and secondly uh, united states uh, warned pakistan not to back to wide iran gas pipeline that is that possibly led sanctions so question is uh, united states itself have a good energy deal to meet up its energy requirements that is with its non nato major ally qatar but uh, still we are looking that uh, pakistan that is another non nato major ally uh, it seems like united states left it at nowhere to meet up its energy crisis like we, we we are aware about united states green alliance with pakistan but still uh, there is no way for pakistan if to uh, uh, to complete the gas pipeline with iran that like sanction from uh, united states and if not then uh, there will be 18 billion dollar penalty from the iranian side so uh, what is your comment so helping pakistan address its energy shortage crisis is a priority for the united states we have supported the addition of approximately 4000 megawatts of clean energy capacity in pakistan our projects have dramatically increased the nation's electricity capacity today powering the homes of millions of pakistanis additionally through the united states pakistan green alliance a transformative initiative between our two countries we are working together to address today's most pressing environmental challenges especially around water management climate smart agriculture and renewable energy go ahead thank you mike what is your response to india's summoning uh, summoning of the us diplomat of our commerce regarding the arrest of delhi's chief minister kejriwal and how do you view the recent political turmoil in india including the freezing of the opposition party's bank account as the amnesty international described the situation crack down on opposition reaches a crisis point ahead of national election so with respect to the second question we continue to follow these actions closely including the arrest of delhi chief minister uh uh, uh kejriwal we are also aware of the congress congress party's allegations that tax authorities have frozen some of their bank accounts in a manner that will make it challenging to effectively campaign in the upcoming elections and we encourage fair transparent and timely legal processes for each of these issues with respect to your first question i'm not going to talk about any private diplomatic conversations but of course um uh what we have said publicly is what i just said from here that we encourage fair transparent timely legal processes we don't think anyone should object to that and we'll make the same thing clear privately one more on bangladesh on the occasion of bangladesh national day secretary blinken reaffirmed his commitment strengthening democratic uh, strengthening democratic democratic governance and promoting human rights in his statement so could you please give us a sense what step the biden administration may take considering uh, the country is led by an authoritarian prime minister and people are suffering due to absence of democracy and the rule of law So I don't have any specific steps to preview with respect to uh Bangladesh but we have uh, made clear since the outset of this administration that the promotion of democracy is one of the top priorities for the president and secretary blinken has said it's of course one of his top priorities so we continue to make clear in our conversations uh with the government of Bangladesh and you of course uh you and I engaged on this matter quite a few times in the lead up to the election um that we uh wanted to see free and fair elections and we will continue to support um a uh, uh, free full open democracy in Bangladesh Thank you. Thank you. Question on Iraq. The United Nations Mission Unitat, which was set up in 2017 to help Iraq investigating the genocide and the war crimes by ISIS, now due to a soaring of its relationship with the Iraqi is facing permanently shutdown. And the agency says that we haven't finished our work and we need more time to finish the work. And the Iraqi government says that Unitat no longer needed and they were not successful in coordinating with the Iraqi government. So any reaction and comment on that and does the United States support the continuation of Unitat mission in Iraq and how do you assess their mission in Iraq in investigating the ISIS crisis So since Unitat's creation the United States has strongly supported its work which has aided the international community's efforts to bring ISIS members to justice for their atrocities including acts of genocide against religious minorities in Iraq We support an orderly conclusion of Unitad's work. Unitad's evidence sharing with other countries in support of prosecutions of ISIS members abroad is an essential element of its work and we encourage 
UNITAD to work with the Iraqi government on continuing protection measures for witnesses and victims who have bravely provided testimony and evidence. And then finally, we are working to ensure that Iraq and other UN member states can continue to access and benefit from the evidence that UNITAD has collected and that the evidence is properly archived and preserved for future use. Uh, go, yeah, go ahead. Um, before I get to my question, just to follow up on Saeed and some other people, can I get a yes or no as to whether or not the U.S. accepts the Geneva Conventions as applying to the occupied Palestinian territories? Uh, we, of course, accept the Geneva Conventions. Go ahead. Okay, I, I, I wasn't able to get that before. Thank you. Um, uh, Francis Boyle, who successfully uh, represented Bosnia at the, and Herzegovina at the International Criminal Court, as well as Craig Mokhyber, a former UN official who resigned in protest given the ICJ um, uh, orders against Israel and given the UN resolution this last week that uh, demanded an immediate ceasefire, um, are arguing that what is needed now is a uniting for peace procedure at the General Assembly. Um, they are saying that with that procedure, the General Assembly can effectively um, take control of the situation to some extent, given the deadlock at the, at the Security Council, suspend Israel from UN, uh, from participation at the General Assembly, admit Palestine as a member, urge economic sanctions against Israel, and set up a tribunal as the UN, as the UN did for Rwanda and Yugoslavia. What would the U.S. do if uh, the General Assembly did that? So I, I would say, first of all, uh, I would reject the premise that there is deadlock at the UN Security Council. We just saw the UN Security Council pass a resolution this week uh, on this very question. Uh, and with but respect it to- it, just with, demanded with, a ceasefire. Just, just, just with, with respect to any effort at the General Assembly to expel Israel, no, no, obviously it's, that's it's not to expel, it's to suspend. To, to, uh, to suspend Israel, it's not something that, that we would support. Ultimately, we believe that the resolution to this conflict is something that can be done uh, through direct negotiations, which is what we have um, uh, pursuing to see, um, to achieve an immediate ceasefire that secures the release of hostages uh, and allows humanitarian assistance to flow into the Palestinian people, and we would like to see that expanded, uh, this initial ceasefire, into something uh, more durable and lasting uh, that ensures Hamas's defeat uh, and establishes long-lasting, uh, uh, durable peace for Israel and the Palestinian people. Th thank you for the response, but just, just if I go might, it's just... Take one here and then we'll... uh, no, uh, thank you, Matt. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Um, Guardian uh, reported something which I reported, and Ms. Karine at the White House didn't like it, but I'm sure now at least Ms. Karine and you both would agree that President Biden had sacrificed uh, his vote bank to keep the U.S. national policy intact. And uh, this is, I'm saying, with regard to the Guardian, saying that the Afghans who have brought to the U.S., they are not going to vote for the President Biden because of the Afghanistan foreign policy. More than million, millions of girls are out. The Pakistanis are not, the millions of Pakistanis in the U.S. are not going to vote for President Biden because of the policy over there. The Arabs are not going to vote for President. So is it correct to say that President Biden, because of the national interest and because of his failure on the foreign policy, he is pretty much from the, all the expatriates of these countries that I mentioned, they are not going to be voting for him. So there are a number of premises to that question I reject, but uh, I can't really do so in a detailed way, in a way that discusses an election, something I'm obviously not going to do from the State Department podium. So I think I'll decline to comment other than uh, note my disagreement with that premise. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Can Thanks, I ask everyone. one last? Okay. Thanks.